You're listening to Unjiggered, a bartender podcast where we interview highly successful bartenders about their careers, lives, and the passion of bartending. This week we caught up with Declan McGurk, Director of Bars at the Savoy and Vice President of the United Kingdom Bartenders Guild. We talk about his flaring background, his management style, his passion for innovation, and his journey at the Savoy and the American Bar, including the new songbook menu. With this podcast, we want to peel back the mask and discover just how the greats really became the greats. So sit back and enjoy. Hello, my name is Declan McGurk. I'm the director of bars at the Savoy. More importantly, dad of two girls. Uh, and I've been, you'd never guess when you look at my face and how young and beautiful I do look, but I've been working in this industry for 20 years. 20 years is a very long time. Thank you very much for finding the time, Declan. How's things? Not too bad. A few late nights this week. That makes me feel a bit older. But other than that, all good. (laughs) I know. Cocktail Week is becoming more and more international. I've noticed that there are lots of pop-ups happening around town, which wasn't the case, wasn't it? Yeah, this year I've seen the most. With having the coincidence of 50 best in town, that brings loads of people over. So, yeah, it's good. It's healthy to see. How was it for you? Happy with the event so far? Did you see any more people walking in through the bar? Yeah, like I love this time of year because we just get to see some old friends, um, some people we haven't seen for a long, long time. At highlight last night, we actually had Julio Bermejo's mother. Uh, we got her behind the bar. We got her to make a Tommy's margarita. How is uh, how is she as a bartender? She's a rock star. She's much better <laughs> than you. <laughs> Most likely. Uh, now, you have a very sexy job. I mean, director of bars at the Savoy. And previously, you were managing the American bar. So I guess... The natural question is like, how did you manage to land it? And like, where, where did your career start? Yeah, well, started my career, as I say, in 1999. I was, uh, I was a student studying geology. Um, that is the study of rocks. So I remain a rock star forever. <laughs> um, and I was working as a part-time bartender on the side. And I really started to enjoy the guest and team aspect. One thing led to another. I managed to graduate and I decided that I was going to commit my full time towards working in bars. I had seen a very good example that year of Alex Turner and Angus Winchester. Uh, and what I realized at that point was that um, a very serious job could take place in the bar world. And it wasn't just simply making drinks. Instead, it was a real career. And that's what I try and be quite ambassadorial of. Where was that? I came down to London, I was living in Leeds then, and I came down to London to take part in what was called uh, an IPB training course that they were running. So they were the international Playboy bartenders, Mm -hmm. pretty much the first consultants the UK ever saw. uh, And it was a top to bottom bar training. Um, I learned lots around cocktails, but also more so, I saw two real serious professionals, industry professionals. So the scene in uh, London uh, drastically changed around 2008, 2010, I think is a fair assessment, when when people started to focus more on cocktails. Before that, though, there was a huge emphasis on flair. Am Am I right? Yeah, there was the early 2000s, I think, get a bit, un- they don't get enough radio time. Um, I would say that London was in a very, very strong place in the mid and early 2000s. The match group was at its height. Sasha Petrasky's legacy of cocktails was an industry standard in London. Um, and then, yes, there was a boom of new openings. Um, but the early to mid 2000s, I would say the standards were probably the highest they've ever been. In what respect? Well, you had the the Match Group and TGI Fridays as two groups that were based on training and standards and getting it right. And um, whilst there's probably a better freedom these days and more of a sort of diverse offering, it did mean that there was very much a standard. And I think that what I really noticed was classics, for example, um, you would go into a bar and you'd always get a perfectly made classic. These days you can go into a bar and the bar might not even have the ingredients to make a classic because of their menu theme. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's true, actually. There are some places that are heavily specialized in what they do, and you might not be able to get a classic. Like, in the Singapore, Native is a perfect example where they just will not be able to make you a Negroni if you want a Negroni. I think we need in the industry something like a one-minute classic Tuesday or something just to I teach know, right? people how to make drinks. <laughs> we should have that. So, you'd mentioned, like, the Match Group and TGI Fridays, which nowadays, uh, for perhaps younger bartenders are a bit difficult to grasp and they're seen with a certain degree of negativity. 
what, what do you think uh, are the things that they did for this industry in terms of like setting standards and what what did they do specifically they both had training programs that the level of which we've probably not seen since um tgi has also had a good global interconnectivity as well they had their master bartender program um there were you know only a handful of master bartenders ever working in any city and that was a serious kudos uh the match group had extensive training. If you wanted to go and work in that place, um, you would have many, many exams before you'd be given the opportunity. And then also as well, they did things that very real. Um, for example, simply shaking a drink with citrus and maybe egg white, they would, they would test you multiple, multiple times to make sure that you know how to balance because mm-hmm. balance should be something that comes natural. Um, but if it's not trained early as a foundation, you might not balance the drinks perfectly. So we mentioned about when uh, you've seen uh, bartending as a good career opportunity for you. What was the first job that kind of defined and gave you a little bit of a backbone on bartending? Yeah, I was working at the Square in the Lane Leeds. It was big, big, big site. Um, it was a big, busy cocktail venue. Uh, I did about two and a half years there. And as well as making cocktails, there was flaring and flaring was a big part of it. And I really enjoyed that. So I was on one Sunday every month traveling down to Roadhouse quite often on my own. And I was chucking bottles around and it meant that I started to meet loads of people. Um, It meant that I um, started to look really, really cool because I could flare. Um, (laughs) And that just brought me into the industry. And at the same time, I was uh, a bit different in the sense I was also doing cocktail competitions. Uh, And it's not often that people do both. And I tended to get noticed. So the square in the lane was the perfect platform. Um, I had a very good general manager, a guy called Graham Richmond. uh, And he believed in me and he kept on providing me with various training opportunities as well. Uh, what year was this? Uh, I began working there in 1999. So two years in 1999, that's like a decade for today's days. Yeah, yeah it is. How was paying Leeds? How was like life in Leeds for you? Oh, Leeds was great. Yeah, we're having Le- a blast. Leeds is an amazing city. I love it. Spiritual home. Spiritual home. So after that, what uh, was the next step for you? Yeah, I had got a big break. It didn't last for too long, but it um, brought me into a different part of the industry because um, a guy called Bo Myers, who he was, um, he had just won National Bartender of the Year in Flavor, uh, and he was very much uh, one of the best bartenders knocking around the country. He was based in Manchester. Back then, Manchester was probably slightly ahead of London in terms of standards, Mm -hmm. Uh, and he was the consultant for an opening at Chino Latino. Um, So he gave me that job. Um, We were in a small but close-knit team. And because he was so connected in the industry, um, he brought me into another side of the industry altogether. And also, whilst I was only there for six months, he taught me something about drinks that I hadn't seen before as well, creativity and really making cocktails and not just coming in and learning specs, but instead making our own drinks and things like that. How long? Uh, so you you mentioned it was for six months. And yeah. Why, why did you decide to move on? That was a hotel opening. Um, it was quite a challenging hotel opening, and I was also at the time um, getting a little bit too fond of being in the city life of Leeds and enjoying myself. Uh, and I decided an opportunity came with a company called Arc Inspirations. They were opening their fourth site. I really respected them as operators. They owned my favorite bar at the time called Trio. And they're a really professional operator as well. Uh, so I really, I like always throughout my career to sort of surround myself in professional environments. They offered that um, and I went to open a site of theirs called Zed um, for the opening of it in Chapel Allerton. Mm-hmm. I did that for a few months and then they very swiftly promoted me to be the bar manager at Trio, which was kind of like a dream job for me back then. I was quite a young age to be a bar manager um, but it's all life's all about attitude and just getting the job done. I know, right? And um, how was uh, Trio? What was the brief? Like, what was the main concept of Trio? Trio was still one of the best. It's now closed. It's still one of the best concepts I've seen. As a building, um, it was three floors, and the basement bar was an atmosphere-led bar. 
So we would make cocktails, lots of cocktails, but we'd make them very quick. So it was, um, I, the last menu I had there was a daiquiri menu. There was just a load of varieties of daiquiris, but they were drinks that we could quickly deliver with good products, delicious, less about the, um, the visuals of them. But the big thing in that bar was the music. And uh, we didn't ever use DJs. We didn't use live music. Instead, we had a mini disc player behind the bar. The bar was a four-station bar, and if you were on the mini-disc station, you were responsible for two things. You were responsible for serving the people in front of you and playing the music. So oh, That's awesome. Because a thing with DJs is they'll quite often be playing music to themselves. When you're behind the bar, you can really feel the vibe mm-hmm. of the place. So we would um, we'd be having to make quite a lot of drinks, and you'd be stacking up the mini-discs and things like that um, and trying your best to generate a really good atmosphere. A high volume bar though, like a lot of drinks. It was high volume and then we counted that with on the top floor, a bar called Skippy's, um, which was table service cocktail bar and it was quite an aspirational um, bar back in the day. We were pretty much the first place in Leeds to do measuring our drinks. So Leeds was a big free pour city, but we decided to discipline ourselves and um, use measures. Um, that was all original cocktails, all fresh ingredients. And we're talking mid 2000s. We were very much um, ahead of the game, really. I was working with an old team member of yours, Rashid. Uh-huh. Um, and there was a few of other like minded creatures. And we were really trying to sort of elevate the drinking scene. Music was still important. Downstairs was very much rock and roll. Um, up here was a bit more of a kind of uh, late night, almost jazz esque at times feel. So, talking about quality of ingredients, which is something that you mentioned a few times, have you noticed a shift towards uh, like sort of pre-packed ingredients to fresh ingredients? Because this is the time when people started to discuss that specific, like fresh citrus, fresh juices, things like that. When I first came into bartending, the norm across the country would have been sweet and sour mix. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was a handful of bars that didn't use sweet and sour mix. Uh, My first bar job was sweet and sour mix was what you used. Um, And yeah, fresh citrus didn't really get utilized too much. Uh, The match group were the group that really changed that. Uh, Dale DeGroff was over here and uh, insisting upon fresh ingredients coming in and being used. And that's what the revolution started really in this country. So after Skippies, what was... uh... Uh, your career development? How I was you? with that company for nearly a decade. Um, so started off as a head bartender, then a bar manager, then a bars manager in that building. Um, then I became the bars development manager. Uh, I was responsible for the opening of all the sites. Um, we, By the time I left, um, we were on site number eight. So I oversaw four further openings. Uh, I was the full opening manager, so I did everything. Uh, I was working over the concept, where the lights are, um, to how to fit the safe in the office, uh, getting the cellar installation organized, uh, making sure that we had the plumbing for the coffee machine. Uh, Then I would get that site open and then tend to move on to the next project as well, whilst always overseeing all the drinks menu of the company as well. So talking about uh, independent bar companies, uh, could you share with us some of the funny stories you had to deal with? Because like when you are in an independent bar, it's not like in a hotel or like where you have your security department or whoever. So did you have anything funny to share? Yeah, like uh, I don't think I've opened a bar and remembered to order straws. So that's the greatest <laughs> thing about sustainability is that we don't use straws anymore. And it means you don't forget to order them for the opening. Uh, openings are just awesome. I remember we were opening a bar in Harrogate called Banyan. And Harrogate's a great town. It's a very affluent town in the north of England. Um, and they're really nice people there as well. And we're opening Banyan and we thought we're, we're a load of Leeds guys in this town. We need to get to know them. So we decided to have a big night out, but then we realized we've got no way of getting home. So we had a van. So we all slept in the van. There were three of us and we slept in the van overnight, it started to get freezing. So we turned the engine on to keep the, the heating on. Anyway, the next morning we of course needed the toilet. So a bit like the A team kicked the double doors open, started having a wee out the back of it. Uh, looked up and then saw the builders were there waiting for us to let them in. <laughs> cool. So what made you change after 10 years with them? 
Amy and I, my wife, um, we weren't married then, but uh, we were quite keen to move down south. Um, not just because of London career, um, but more for personal reasons as well. Amy's family are all from Kent. Uh, my family are all living in Ireland. And we had long-term plans to set up our own family. And before we did that, we wanted to settle down near one set of our family. Uh, mine live in County Fermanagh, Northern Ireland, which is a beautiful place. Um, but not necessarily the same career opportunities. Um, so we moved down to Kent. Uh, we settled ourselves in Bromley, uh, and that obviously meant then I had the access to work in London. And how did that go for you? Great, yeah. I um, have now been in London for um, pretty much a decade. Uh, love London. I've got two young kids as well, and I think growing up in London for them, it's, uh, you know, they're spoiled really. We live 12 miles out of the center, so it means that we can have a bit more of a normal life out there um, and travel into London and enjoy it, see all the museums, come in Christmas and see the Christmas lights. So, you know, our kids really, I grew up in a place called Blackpool and it's not quite as glamorous <laughs> as, uh, as London. So our kids are really, really lucky. Um, and London's just an amazing city. I just, I've fallen in love with it. What was the first job you had here in London? I was working for a company called Speciality Brands. Um, they're a really, really good brand company, uh, looking after Diplomatico Rome in particular, Tapatio Tequila, um, and then also uh, a number of other sort of small family-led products uh, and got to, got to work really as a band, brand ambassador, um, going around, doing presentations, trainings, things like that. What were the challenges you had coming from bars to brands? Yeah, well, Amy and I had moved down for personal reasons. And what I wanted to do as well was to sort of see if I could uh, work in a different environment. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, having had 20 years of experience in the industry, I can see that there are sometimes challenges to working evenings. So I wanted to give working in brands a go. Uh, I was fortunate to work with a really good company as well and really good brands. It was good. I did enjoy it. I always loved public speaking and doing that sort of thing. However, while I was doing it, I did have a longing to be back in operations. I felt that my skills are best in coaching and developing a team, uh, managing a group of people. Um, and I suppose I've sort of made myself as a bit of a bar management specialist and I was really missing it. So I had one eye on potentially trying to get myself in a position to open my own place. One thing led to another um, and the reality of applying for the bar manager of the American bar presented itself. So before we move to that specific job, how long have you been working for brands? I did it for two years, just over two years. Two years. And do you think it's a good jump for people to do, like to move from brands, to, from bars to brands? Or do you think it has to come with a specific like idea, for instance, you need to find the right brand or the right person or because a lot of people, the reason why I'm asking this is because there's a lot of people who see brands as a way out. Like, as you mentioned, you, you work evenings in the bar and think, okay, maybe if I work for a brand, I work less or I work better hours. Was that the case for you? Or? And I think that that's where people will get it wrong as well. It's definitely not a way out. And if you're looking at it as a way out, you're probably not going to enjoy it. Um, I certainly didn't see it as a way out and I saw it as an alternative part to the industry. Um, but ultimately as well, if you're going to work in a brand, you have to be ready that you are working in sales. And if you don't think that you're working in sales, then you're misrepresenting what the actual job is as well. So you've got to be willing to have that mindset. I think that um, working within bars, there are a lot of transferable skills. Um, the building of connections, um, the talking, the friendliness, um, the creativity. And I do think that brands represents an excellent opportunity for people to go and work within. Um, but at the same time, um, going there as a way out um, is definitely not the route. And also, if you're doing brands well, you're going to be probably doing quite a few evenings anyway, because that's uh, going to be quite likely the time where a lot of your products are used the most. And that's when you need to be about. Great. Uh, so the opportunity of uh, managing the American bar comes around. How did that opportunity come to you? Yeah, it had been something the Savoy when had meant a lot to me. Uh, I traveled down on my own in 2002 because I read about Peter Dorelli retiring. So I was down here for a roadhouse, but I decided I was going to put my suit on. Um, and instead of flare in my usual jeans and a T-shirt, I flared in a black suit. I then decided that I was going to pop into the American bar just to see it. 
it was a Sunday and Peter wasn't there, but still there was just a certain magic to the room and it's always meant a great deal to me. When the Savoy was closed for a long period of time, um, that had a lot of people talking. It opened with a big bang in 2010 and everyone was really interested, you know, who that opening team was going to be, who was going to be the head bartender. Um, And also, interestingly, there was a guy called Daniel Berenreuter who was the opening bar manager. I had a lot of time for what the Savoy was and got to know everyone here, knew a lot of the team anyway. And I remember at first there was the Beaufort bar manager position was available where I went home and I debated it a little bit whether or not I should apply for that. It just didn't feel right natural. It didn't feel right. So I didn't apply for it. But I remember I was actually talking to Daniel's wife, Jen, about the American bar position being available. And it was her who put the thought in my head um, because she and we were working together at the time. And she just sort of said uh, that she feels that they're kind of looking for someone like me. And I remember it was um, March and um, we were due to have a baby in July, our first kid. So in theory, it's probably the worst time in the world to think about going for this. So I thought before I get too excited, uh, I need to go home. I need to speak to Amy. And I'm guessing that she's going to just say, no way, this is too much. And I was pretty resigned to the fact that that's what we would probably agree on. But still, nonetheless, um, relationships need to be quite open and talk things through. Otherwise, you might get a bit of resentment. So I got home. I remember us having a chat in the kitchen. um, And I remember sort of saying, listen, this is the opportunity. Um, It's probably going to be quite a long application process. What do you think? And I really didn't know where it was going, but it's a bit stupid of me for for not knowing how she would approach it because she just straight away said to me, 100%, this is what you should do. Uh, When we got together, this is exactly the sort of thing I thought you would be doing. And um, I'm in complete support. So started what was quite a long interview process, did five interviews, I think it was. Um, I had an informal conversation with Daniel who had expressed that he was in support of my application, but these big buildings, um, there's no such thing really as an easy routine. You've got a lot of due diligence, a lot of people that you're going to sit down with and meet. So I did all the interviews and then, hey, presto, um, come the May, I was starting as the um, as the bar manager, um, managing a, a group of individuals, including the very famous Michele Mariotti. I know, right? <laughs> so how did you approach such a mighty position? Because it's there are a lot of pre-existing conditions here that you need to sort of be aware of before you can start jumping on board and, and getting stuff done, right? Yeah, and you approached it the exact same I've approached everything. And also everyone says to me that, um, oh, wow, you know, you work at the Savoy. It must be very different to the other places you've worked. No, not at all. They're all exactly the same. Our in, our industry is really simple. Uh, humankind has a this uh, excellent ability at making things more complicated than they should be. But our business is about two things and two things alone, team and guests. Now, coming in as a bar manager, then it's very, very obvious that I've got to do two things. One, I had to present myself well to the guests. And I was really keen, the regulars, the characters, to make sure that I introduced myself and met them. But ultimately, as the manager, I'm more responsible for the team. So the first thing for me was simply getting to know the team on arrival and uh, uh, from, you know, head bartender Eric, who was someone I did know, but I didn't know so well. And we developed a friendship that became and is still very, very close. Uh, And then to people like yourself and the rest of the team and Uh, whenever a manager's coming in, there's probably going to be some changes. But I also think a big bit of advice for anyone, if you're going into an environment that you need to just go in and meet people first. So I had no set plan. Uh, My first plan was to come in and get to know everyone first, get to know what motivates them, get to know if there were any um, any issues. Um, One thing I did pick up on early doors uh, with the American bar was um, people um, felt that they would like to contribute a bit more to the idea of cocktail menus and the making of the drinks. And if we look now, I've been here six and a half years and we're about to launch a menu in the Beaufort bar. 
whereby every single team member who works in the Bow Foot Bar has contributed a cocktail to that menu, including Sophie, who's one of our hosts, who hasn't even been bar trained yet. But you don't need to be bar trained to contribute a cocktail because we can work with you on the principles of balancing the drink. We've got enough people there. I'm a big believer that it's about empowering the team and making, if you're going to sell cocktails, if you're going to sell drinks, I want the team to feel a part of that and a genuine part of owning that. So when you joined the American bar, it was in a period of shifting, right? There was the shift from the opening team to what came like sort of a stable team that we, you had for about two to three years. Yeah. How did you go about trying to reshape it and keep it close? Yeah, well, as I say, you know, the first thing was to get to know everyone and um, then provide leadership, mentoring and coaching. Um, the thing with mentoring, it's a never ending journey. And uh, you will forever be in and out of relationships with people that you're working with and developing that and, and keeping that moving. And sometimes um, as a leader, you're going to have to make hard decisions. And it might be that someone's not right for that position at the right time for, for both parties. Or it might be that you're enforcing some discipline. I remember something, um, an example I always give, and I was talking to him this week, was we had a bartender arrive here called Martin Hudak, who used to work with Michele, of course. And uh, Martin arrived from Slovakia. He hadn't really been out of Slovakia a great deal, um, but we really believed in him as an individual. He struggled to get his grip with some things in the early days, and also he um, would struggle in his relationship with myself. We didn't have the best first relationships because I was really enforcing some discipline on him, such as making sure that to be early is to be on time and various other things so that I could help shape him. But what I also noticed was this was creating quite a bit of resistance, and I could have continued, and it probably wouldn't have ended very nicely. But the thing is, I could see that there was real potential there. So I couldn't just stick to my guns and constantly be enforcing this era of resistance. And instead, I also got to know him as a person, got to develop a very good friendship. What I noticed by the end was I would never have to manage Martin. And instead that Martin, the principles that we agreed on were right um, he would then be an enforcer of these. And the point there is that as a manager, you, you can't manage people. People have to manage themselves and you have to get them to understand the why. If a team member doesn't have the understanding of the why, well, then they're going to constantly make mistakes. Um, and when mistakes happen as well, you, the elephant in the room is that you need to talk about them. Um, a, another friend of ours was Luca Corradini, and um, he was one of those people that would forever be making mistakes. And the fact of the matter is, um, that's how we build such a great friendship because we were constantly spending one-on-one -on -one time together just <laughs> reviewing these things. But making mistakes are a brilliant way of learning. And the best learners are the ones that have the, the lack of arrogance to learn from mistakes. How did you go... So how did you shape the American bar as such? What were the first things that uh, you did in terms of like menu development and things like that? Yeah, and what I would say about shaping the American bar is that uh, no one person does it. And the American bar is uh, this amazing room and institution that whilst you're working there, um, you've got to make the best of that opportunity whilst you're there. But also be very, very aware if you're gone that someone else can come in the next day because who doesn't want to go and work there at some point in the bar mm -hmm. career? So you're whilst you're there, you have to make the most of the opportunity. And what I believe with the American bar is that it has got a great history, but if we are constantly talking about the history, people are going to get bored. And whilst we are working there, we have to write the next chapter so that hopefully people will tell stories in the future. And I'll give a very good example of that is that Joe Gilmore arrived and in 1969, when the Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, he made the moonwalk cocktail. He sent the cocktail to NASA they enjoyed the drink while they are landed back on Earth. And we in our museum have a letter written to Joe Gilmore thanking him for the cocktail. So there you have the head bartender of the American bar in the 60s, not just making Harry Craddock's cocktails. He was making his own legacy and he was making sure that people will tell stories about him. And that's what we have to do. Um, time at the uh, American bar is going to be a roller coaster. You're going to have some highs. You're going to have some lows. You're probably going to do the loop, the loop. But the key is you drive the roller coaster and you make sure you have one hell of a ride while you're doing it. So you mentioned about looking forward and uh, sort of like 
making sure you're always at the sharp end of the of the bartending community and how did you do that at the American bar what are the actual steps that you guys took yeah we at one point realized that we weren't good enough and um we had there are, there is way more to life than things such as 50 best bars um but 50 best bars was a very useful tool for us at one point because um we were a little bit surprised that we'd um dropped to number 20 but the fact that we were surprised um, meant that we also weren't doing enough and um, whilst I don't think a bar business model should be about positioning themselves on a 50 best list seeing a big drop um, that we'd seen suggested to us that people are getting a bit bored and it suggested to us that maybe we weren't doing enough innovation and that really provided inspiration to sit down and have, for want of better description, crisis meetings. And they were at first quite regular. And that was with um, myself, Eric, and Daniel. Uh, and then we then cascaded those meetings to the team as well. Um, and there, it, Rome isn't built in a day, and it still did take us a long time. But a critical moment was we decided that we wanted to do a really authentic cocktail menu concept. Um, the menu was adapted from your own suggestion, um, which was taking a map of London. Uh, and we then implemented a storytelling mentality toward our menus because the Savoy is a hotel of first. It is the hotel of stories. And I think applying that mentality to our drinks theme is what keeps people engaged. And each year now, we do do a theme, um, but it's an authentic Savoy theme. It is storytelling, and it's ensuring that we have that engagement level with our guests. So you started the relaunching sort of the bar and uh, starting to focus a bit more on like uh, concepts as such for the menu. Would you like to talk to us about uh, your uh, most recent menu? Most recent menu is, without a shadow of a doubt, the one I'm most proud of. The current menu was something we wanted to do for a long time, but it was inspired by one person. And John Nichol um, is our resident piano player. And this year he turned 15 years, one five years, playing the piano at the American Bar. Uh, the American Bar is a very, very famous cocktail bar. But in my opinion, it's as much a piano bar as it is a cocktail bar. The piano brings people in and that keeps people sat at their tables. The concept of bars are different to restaurants. In a restaurant, your order is mandated through a menu, but the reality is a lot of people walk into a bar and they already know what they're going to drink, or they might simply not need to look at a menu. But the piano is enforcing itself on our guests because it's right in the middle of the floor, and we've got a great history of musicians. We had a piano player who played for 20 years called Mike McKenzie, who was very, very famous, and he was close friends with Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra would come into the bar and he would sing. We still, to this day, have a lot of musicians that come into our bar, and we have a real good music pedigree. They might even lean over and sing a few words, but of course, we don't talk about our guests and reveal their identities. But just keep your eyes out while you're in that bar. But you really never do know who's going to be there. So we really want to do something about our music and bring it to life. And the best way we can bring something to life is to use it as inspiration for a cocktail menu. So we created the Savoy Songbook hosted by the American Bar. 20 songs inspiring the 20 cocktail creations. And also on top of that, John recorded the album and we put that on Spotify because the Savoy is 130 years old, but it's really important that we are engaging with things such as Spotify, Instagram. We serve our drinks on a bespoke coaster, um, which has the American bar wording on it. So that means when anyone takes a photo in our bar and they share it on Instagram, then you see exactly where they are um, because we have a very, very broad range of, of ages of guests and type of guests that come in here. You'll have people who've been coming here for 50 years. You'll have people who come because they are going to the theater and this is the first time that they are popping in. You might have someone who comes here because their grandfather used to come here. Um, and recently we had a couple 
who were getting married. They they were getting married. It was a small affair, and they popped in that evening. And we knew that they were coming. And the brief to the team was that we have to make it special for them. They've just got married today. They're choosing to come into our bar, and the potential is that the rest, multi generations of their family, are going to do the same as well. So, um, what we have to try and do through our menu offering is engage a real broad range of guests. So looking at the, the songbook and the choice of songs on there, we've got some real jazz standards. There's a lot of Sinatra, but also we took some modern songs. Um, we have a drink uh, on there inspired by Empire State of Mind, um, Concrete Jungle. We have a drink on there inspired by an original song that John's made called the American Bar Song. We called that cocktail the Crystal Star. And what was important was to not simply name the drinks after the uh, name the drinks the same name as the songs because that's the name of the song and we wanted to brand our own drinks we even named a drink um called hashtag no makeup it's inspired by i say a little prayer for you and we just believe that that's uh, gone as an advertising for apple mac really <laughs> that's what i believe yeah no way well that's good so at least uh, they have their inspiration right <laughs> when it comes to marketing right so and in terms of drinks, how did you go about uh, structuring the menu? What, what sort of drinks do you fit where and how? Yeah, we put a lot of thought into this. We're a bar that's open all day. Um, and something that I've developed over the years is making sure that we're better organized. And uh, looking back to our days, Michaeli, we were probably a little bit haphazard in our approach at yeah, times sure. in getting everything organized. <laughs> so um, something that um, particularly with Maxim Schulter's arrival as head bartender, something he really did employ was a great level of organization. Uh, we have got, we launch a menu every year in April and the process of that menu is a year. Uh, we are in the process of the next menu at the moment. We'd be in the creative part at the moment thinking what we want to do. We would just be out of the stage where we're re reviewing the strengths and weaknesses of it. What we do is we map the drinks. So we, in our back corridor, we have a map and we will use a few different benchmarks. One, we will put sort of um, references to classic cocktails. We're not saying that we're twisting classic cocktails, but we're saying if someone drinks a Negroni, have we got a drink that's going to be similar to that? If someone drinks a Cosmopolitan, have we got something that's going to appeal to that person? And the reason why we add that structure is it means that all the best-selling styles of drinks that we have an equivalent style on our menu. The other thing that we add a lot of discipline to is ensuring that we've got um, a wealthy amount of long drinks, whether they be long and fruity or more highball, whiskey highball based drinks, because I think long drinks are really important. Uh, we're open during the daytime. Sometimes people don't want a stirred brown drink and sometimes they want a refreshing drink. And with long drinks, there's a diversity of styles in those as well. You've got your long, fresh light to the real dark, intense long drinks. The other thing that we put a lot of focus on is we see every year drinks with vodka doing very, very well on the menu. So we've got a massive emphasis on our vodka cocktails now. Uh, our um, best-selling drink this year is a gin drink. It's got purple glitter in it. So uh, it's, in helps. it's inspired by Purple Rain. It's called Electric Lover. Um, but our next two best-selling drinks are both vodka-based drinks, and they've both got champagne in as well. We noticed that champagne um, cocktails with vodka is a marriage that people like. And if you ignore what people like, you're setting yourself up to fail. Mm -hmm. So vodka cocktails are something that we put a lot of time and effort into and making sure that we have got those sort of styles of drinks on there. I don't get it that there is a um, bartender attitude against vodka. Um, for me, that's arrogant because um, wherever I've worked, it's always been the best-selling spirit. So thus, we try and make the best that we possibly can with that. Yeah, there are bars that don't stock vodka, like zero vodka. Yeah, and some of my great pals uh, work in those as well. And uh, I just think, though, that um, it's a category that people do enjoy. And even recently in the Bowfoot Bar, we decided to make our own Bowfoot Bar vodka, which I'm going to bring you to come and taste straight after this. Um, the reason we did that was um, for this reason that we see that people love vodka. Uh, we do think that maybe in terms of the amount of variety of vodkas that are out there with uh, really interesting flavors and aroma is a little bit limited. So I get it why there is some bartender resistance toward it. But we don't have guest resistance toward vodka. So thus, you have to listen to your guests. Mm -hmm. um, bartenders don't pay your wages. It's guests that pay the wages.
So you mentioned earlier on that uh, throughout your time here, especially at the beginning, you developed uh, a bond uh, with Eric as a head bartender. Uh, Eric worked here for a long period of time, but eventually he moved on. And how did you take that and what steps did you take towards uh, uh, replacing him? Yeah, well, sort of just touching the relationship with Eric. Yeah, we were very, very close and... uh, we actually once won an award, a personality award. I know, right? Yeah. But instead of instead of an in, in, individual winning it, we both won it. So we got back, and the team thought this was hilarious, and they nicknamed us Derek. Um, <laughs> and uh, we've had a lot of great times together, Eric and I. Um, we've travelled various bits of the world together, and we've even managed to uh, ground a plane in our lifetime. But that's a story that has to stay off air, I'm afraid. Um, Now, uh, when Eric was leaving, it wasn't something that was a huge surprise to me because uh, we were working very, very closely um, and I knew that there were various things um, that could potentially happen. And also, he had given the Savoy eight years uh, and I think that uh, we're working in a very transient world now where uh, people coming and spending 30, 40 years is going to happen a lot less. Eric had given a very, very good eight years to the bar and um, we had a very open, honest relationship. So I knew it was coming. Um, the first step for me when Eric was leaving was, um, though, I wanted to make sure we controlled the narrative. And uh, him and I discussed a bit of a strategy on announcing his departure. And what we did was... He decided that he would like um, um, to speak with Hamish Smith. Well, I had suggested to Eric we go down a journalistic approach. And instead of Eric doing a post in his own social media, uh, we talked to a journalist. And Eric said he would like to do this with Hamish Smith. So what I did was I called Hamish. And uh, we were just about to launch a menu. So Hamish thought this was just another ploy to per, to sort of pimp our new menu. So I called Hamish and I said, um, I've got the story of the year for you. Um, and um, on Tuesday at six o'clock, I'm going to send a Savoy car to pick you up wherever you are. Uh, and we're going to have a meeting. And I didn't know what, how Hamish would respond, but he said, yeah, cool. And at this point, he still thinks it's going to be about our cocktail menu. So anyway, we sent our house car out to pick him up, and I greeted him at the front door. But instead of bringing him up to the American bar, I decided to bring him up to our Savoy Suite, which is a beautiful bedroom that we have overlooking the Thames. Uh, We're the only five-star hotel overlooking the Thames, so it means that these, these rooms have real stunning views. We brought him up there, and we served him a martini, and in that room was Eric, Eric. We also had um, Alice, one of our team members. Uh, We had Dominic, who is one of our experienced team members. And we had a brand new guy called Christian, um, because I just wanted some team members to be there for that moment. Uh, we had David Bowie playing on the music. But wait, did the team members know that uh, the announcement was about? We to... had told the team that morning because ah, okay, also cool. what was very important is um, that the team heard that first. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But we knew the minute we told the team, whilst we had a great level of trust, we knew we were on borrowed time before this would start of leaking course, yeah. out. So Hamish, we sat him down, we gave him some cocktails, we gave him some food, and we told the story of Eric's career at the Savoy and we told him that um, that whilst he would be forever a head bartender, that he was going to be hanging up his white jacket and allowing someone else to step in and become the next head bartender. But there was a really important message, and that was that you never stop being a head bartender. And what we really wanted to do was inspire Hamish. He was a journalist, so we can't tell him what to write. We wanted to inspire him that he'd write an article that celebrated Eric's time that also celebrated the role of head bartender because Eric was the 10th head bartender uh, over a 100-year history. So we really wanted it to celebrate that legacy, the others that have worked before him, um, and then also help set Eric up for his next venture because I knew that Eric was going to be opening in a bar and I wanted to make sure as well it was very very clear that he was leaving with a celebration with our full support so that everyone would then see that as a positive thing and that would then help his business so in controlling the narrative that way um, we managed to inspire Hamish to write an amazing article. He released it the next morning through Drinks International, and we broke the story in quite a professional manner like that. 
And that, that was really the first step of replacing Eric, was getting the information out. Eric still was going to be with us for quite a fair few more weeks after that. And it didn't really, um, the, the next step didn't really start um, because it didn't really feel right while Eric was still working in the building to, to talk about a replacement. My approach, though, I really didn't want to put myself in a box and I wanted to be really open to what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. And um, I had conversations with quite a few people. Um, I was open to talking to anyone. Um, there were some people who reached out to me from various wakes of life and I was really open because what I wanted to do was respect the role with the most professionalism possible and make sure I was open to at least having a conversation with anyone. Um, the selection of um, Maxim did come relatively quickly. Um, we had gone live also with an article with Difford's Guide where I had done an interview with them talking about what sort of things we'd potentially look for. The most important thing for me was that someone would come in who could grow with the role. I didn't want to, I certainly didn't want to replace Eric with someone who'd come in with two guns blazing um, uh, to be there to purely and simply make their mark and, and benefit from the glory of the role. I wanted someone to come in motivated, but also it's not about, this bar is not about its head bartender, it's not about its manager, it's about that team. Uh, and I wanted someone who'd be coming in to be the leader of the team and making sure that we continue to produce great team members. I've got people all around the world that I've worked with here that I've got very close relationships with. And uh, I'm as proud about people who've left and gone on to other great success as the ones that have had great success here. Um, succession and developing people and allowing people to leave with your backing and going and doing great things is um, something that um, I think gone are the days where you can say I don't talk to you when you leave me uh, because that's an archaic mentality so the process continued to develop and um, I was having a few conversations with a few people and interestingly I had a conversation with Eric because I said uh, uh, you know, um, who do you think? Uh, and Eric was never the kind of guy to um, to tell me what to do. Um, that wasn't his style at all. Uh, and he was quite relaxed and he was quite trusting of it. Um, but I remember saying to him that uh, I wouldn't mind having a conversation with Maxim because I remember that you got on very well with him, Eric, when you were over there in Macau and he'd been over here as well. Um, so I decided just to, like I did with a few people, just to have a neutral conversation with Maxim. And the big difference there was um, the, the, what was a neutral conversation, uh, and I had approached a few people just to have chats with, it, he really grabbed it, and he grabbed that moment. And that was the other thing is, uh, this is an amazing opportunity for anyone to come into, and it needed to be someone who is really going to, with two hands, make the application process their own. Uh, and that's what he did. And also I felt that um, he was someone who was going to come in and respect the role. He was someone who was not going to make it all about himself and instead about the team. And if you can see during uh, Max's tenure, probably the most successful things he's had has been supporting the development of Pippa Guy, who released a book, got nominated in Tales. But what Pippa will 100% support is Max has been in her corner massively helping her, supporting her, and they've got a brilliant relationship um, and that was important about, you know, I had that opportunity to give someone the task of being head bartender, but I wanted to make sure that that person would come in with that right mindset and really grow with the role. Um, I want them to grow as an individual while they're doing it. Um, and also, more importantly, they needed to be ready to come in and grow the team because the American bar is one of those really amazing places to work that is much bigger than yourself it's it's a place that's not going to go anywhere it's going to be here for the future and whilst you're here you've got great opportunity that just make it the most you possibly can uh slight change of topics uh you mentioned to me football football <laughs> yeah you mentioned to me a while ago uh, while i was still working here that you would never want to manage both bars but uh, there <laughs> you go that's what you do now how did you get to do that and uh, I suppose the saying should be never say never. Exactly. Uh, and that is a motto. Yeah, once upon a time, I was so passionate about the American bar that I definitely didn't want to um, sort of spread myself across the two bars. 
Um, but um, a few reasons, really. Number one, I think it's quite healthy for me to release the American bar a little bit as well and let someone else um, drive it forward because I, I think that um, being able to let go of things is quite important. We It kind of started to come by default because um, the bar manager was leaving and um, myself and the hotel manager, Ian, um, we started to work together on that strategy, replacement strategy, and I just started to take up more responsibilities over there. And one thing led to another. And um, after a period of time, I was already too far down a route of um, getting involved there. And now as I look at it, I'm uh, very motivated to to really help develop the Beaufort Bar. Um, it's a wonderful room. It's a wonderful space. We've got an amazing team in there. And also what's great about the American Bar is it's very different to the, uh, sorry, the Beaufort Bar is very different to the American Bar. It is, for want of a better description, a more elevated experience. The American Bar is quite busy. It is quite high volume at times, and it's quite high energy. The Beaufort Bar is a more secluded environment. You have got more time at the table, and as such, it's a more elevated bar experience. Also, the American Bar has a very, very high volume of non-resident guests. As a hotel bar, yes, it is a hotel bar. However, it has got kind of street bar feel to it. The Beaufort Bar is very much a hotel bar. Um, And what we've got now is we've developed four key pillars. Our four key pillars there are our grower champagne and um, sparkling wine offering, our amazing spirit selection with with a lean toward whiskey, a mixed drink selection, as good as anywhere, and also our bar food. Uh, And those are our four key pillars, and it's very much that total hotel bar experience. So these days, the American bar will always be in my heart, but I'm amazingly enthused to be a part of the Beaufort Bar and very, very lucky to have some really great people working there um, and um, making their mark on the Savoy in a totally different way. You mentioned that you are about to launch a new menu. Uh, we've seen some bits and bobs on social media. Is there any information that you'd like to spare? Yeah, I never understand these people who keep these things secret. It doesn't make sense because if you get the opportunity for, to vocalize a concept, you should do it because it might get someone to talk about it. We're going to launch on the 16th of October the Beaufort Bar uh, menu called Interpreted Magic. Um, it is a three-part menu. So there are three sections to it. So you can um, choose your drinks and food through your emotion. Each section has its own food offering. So the first section will be all cold food. The next section is all um, warm food. And the last section is sharing food. Uh, Each section has its own mixed drinks offering. And the the concept is um, part of, uh, it's all inspired by magic. So we've got... um, the turn, the pledge, and the prestige are the bits of the other sections in the menu, and they are the three sections in a magic performance. However, what we are doing though is we're moving away from the gimmick of magic tricks. We're not talking about pulling rabbits out of hats, but instead we're really looking at the romance and the story, and it's a very elegant look toward magic. So it's not about our drinks are going to be very, very fine reserve luxury hotel bar drinks. And it's about taking the inspiration from uh, various magical stories, such as Merlin and his madness, to even more day, more modern day magicians, um, Tim Berner Lee, who invented the internet, because there's a certain magic in those sort of things. We've got amazing illustrations going in there, and we're also utilizing colors on the menu. Um, the three sections are going to be colored. There is a red section, a white section, and a black section. Um, the illustrations are all one um, set block color. Um, so it means that as well as a real mood to each section. And what we do is then we place our spirit categories and our champagnes, our wine offerings into where we think is the most appropriate mood just to try and really help our guests. Um, so that if someone says they like whiskey, we then say, brilliant, go to the go to the black pages. That's where all our whiskey cocktails are. That's where our whiskey list is you'll certainly be able to find something in there. Ah, so you not only divide food and cocktails, but every single beverage item is Absolutely. divided. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
It's very, very cool. Yeah, and we've had to learn because we started that on the last menu, music, magic, and drama. Um, but like I say, with cocktail menus, we have to look at our strengths and weaknesses. We really like the concept, but we found that with the music, magic, and drama, the, the guest navigation of it could be a bit better. And that's where this simple fact of the coloring the pages of the menus, mm. as, uh, as simplistic as it sounds, that's really to help it map it out for, for the guests as well. The other thing what we wanted to do with this menu is uh, we're, it, we are a luxury hotel. We wanted to make sure that we put it into a very, very nice professionally bound book book as well uh, we noticed that a lot of our guests like to buy the menus so we do sell them um, and they like to keep the, them as a bit of Savoy nostalgia um, so we want it to be a really really nice um, book uh, we've got very it's important to know what you do and what you don't do and something that we don't do we're not designers we're not menu designers and um, we're fortunate in the in our two bars that we've got two really good design partners. Um, we were working with a guy called Chris Edmonds in the American bar. Um, and um, what I don't want to do is then bring him over to the Bowfoot bar and, and do the menu. We've got um, Matthew Shearer in the in the Bowfoot bar is is behind our menu and his team. Um, so we've got amazing sort of ideas there. We've just embarked on um, some photography that's going to be pretty cool. Uh, the images are just coming through at the moment. And um, they are, we're trying to look at photography in quite a um, creative mindset um, so that they're telling the kind of like the story. Um, and um, it's that's going to hopefully be quite a stimulus because these days you've got such a massive opportunity through your social media to get your message sent out and to make people want to come and have a drink in your bar. Yeah, no, and social media is such an important part of running a bar nowadays. It's unbelievable. You know, it's free advertising, right? Yep. I mean, it's, uh, it's starting to become relatively free, but... <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. We mentioned uh, what are the future plans for Bofur Bar and we mentioned a little bit about what is it that you have uh, contributed towards. Uh, but as you mentioned, the Savoy itself has a long and strong history. Did you ever find yourself limited by this history or not? Definitely not. The Savoy is the place where anything is possible. Um, and the greatest thing that we have is our guests. Um, they really seek us out. Uh, and it's the same as well as a manager in my experience of team members as well. People seek us out. They want to come here for an experience. So the challenge is to make it as memorable as possible for both the team and the guests so that the Savoy stays with them. And um, it's um, I really love the way we can express ourselves here as well. Um, we have got an excellent managing director who he believes that um, it, it's our job to go and deliver the concepts um, so we have a very good creative input and anything is possible. Uh, Chris Moore once set a menu to space. Uh, watch this space. We might do something with Chris and sending something to space next year. To be honest with you, maybe I should try and send Chris Moore to space. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, stop him moaning about everything all the time. <laughs> Open a coupette on the moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I wonder, can apples grow on the moon? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> So it was a pleasure to chatting to you. I think we covered uh, just enough. It's such there, there is so much to talk here that we can probably end up talking for uh, another four hours, which I wouldn't make for a great podcast content. But, but ultimately, <laughs> you, you're getting thirsty, and it's maybe a good exactly. time to come and taste the both football vodka. Uh, absolutely, that, that's something that I need to do. Uh, but uh, I have a question that I ask to all uh, the people I interview, which is: if you could choose your last drink, what would that drink be? The last drink yeah. is easy. It's going to always be a martini. Really? Why? A martini is not a cocktail. It's a lifestyle. <laughs> and also, a martini is the hardest drink on the planet to make. And if you think it isn't, if you think it's easy, you're making it wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much for your time, Declan. It was awesome to talk to you. No problem. My pleasure. We hope you enjoyed our interview with Declan. We are unjiggered underscore media on Instagram and you can follow our personal accounts at mmariotti89 for McKelly, Alex J. Murphy for myself and Adrian Besser for Adrian. Thank you for listening.